Tony, if you lived in Australia right now, what could you get today or now that us poor people in North America are going to have to wait a while for? And why? Kangaroo meat? Is that a thing? Yes. Yes. <laughs> what are marsupials? Uh, yeah. uh, I'll take marsupials for 200 um, uh, Alex. <laughs> you can get the new ping stuff. All right. We are back. No putts given. How is everybody living? Tony, we are off for a week. Now we're back. One week hiatus. That's all we get. What? That's it. That's it. But a lot of new equipment, or at least some new equipment coming out. New Pro V1X and Pro V1 golf balls. Ping, G430, Cleveland wedges, PXG, irons. It's kind of a... The Super new- Tour. Super duper tour. Not regular. No, super. 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 Yeah, super tour. So... Here's what we're going to cover today. All right. Should we care about any of these releases? And and if so, how much <laughs> We <should>? better care. <laughs> well, okay, should you care? The uh, people out there, like, does this does this matter to uh, people out there? At all? And, you know, maybe what are some of the uh, salient pieces of information that we can't always get to in an article? Is there other context or things we can we can dive in and discuss a little bit? More, but let's start with this one, Tony. Cleveland, I'm assuming Zipcore wedges. Five out of ten. Big deal. Five out of ten. It's it's middle of the road. Yeah, it's business as usual, routine stuff. And I say that you know we are not privy to the story behind the wedges. What's newer, better, more exciting? But you know, Cleveland in general, not not tremendous storytellers for the most part right it, it's relatively understated generally speaking so i would expect mm-hmm. that to be the case here yeah i think what about from cleveland's perspective i mean this is a big deal to them right this is kind of a this is a flagship product for for the company right it is i would say at this point inarguably the f- remains the flagship product for cleveland i mean they still still in the metal woods but they've kind of gone almost into, I mean, discount Zexio space, right? Kind of the mm-hmm. higher launch for slower swing speed, moderate swing speed, whatever you want to call that demographic. That seems to be where they live now. The irons yep. have transitioned almost exclusively towards the game improvement space. So the wedges mm-hmm. are, are really the only thing. And I guess the putters, because that, that tends to span all categories, no matter who you are, but. Sure. The wedges are the only thing that's that's kind of left under the Cleveland brand that isn't isn't in that game improvement space that is for sort of the masses, the mainstream, the 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 better golfer even. So it's it's yeah. sort of the last of, of that particular side of the Cleveland lineage. Yeah, and it's it's a weird space I, and you know, tour validation goes a number of different ways and and I'm not a huge fan of Ooh, what's in that player's bag because I should take something interesting from that. But from a validation standpoint, like when we look at and, and better players and, you know, people that are watching a podcast or listening to this stuff, you know, where they're going to see Cleveland wedges most likely is in the bag of a professional golfer, right? That's playing likely Strix on irons, right? Because you have Cleveland Strix on Zexio, Dunlop? No, uh, not a, a lot of Dunlop in play. But, you know, under yeah. that, that brand yeah, it's, umbrella. It's umbrella. So, you know, use Hideki, right? Hideki's a great example. Some of these guys, you know, they're playing Strix on irons, which, again, I think are criminally underrated in, in many cases. Um, but that player is likely the one, uh, when you see Cleveland Wedges out on tour, et cetera, that's where you're going to see him. Right. And is in those bags. And yeah, they have tested well for us. Right. They have uh, done some nice things. Like you said, I, I I just don't know that it's a huge market needle mover. Um, some of it, like you said, depends on the storytelling around it. Um, I, I hope I it's not so, the same. I mean, I mean, all things are relative, but Cleveland, too, by some measure, is still a force in the retail market. So, I mean, Vokey. Clear, runaway, uncontested, right. really, number one. There's no there's no valid argument you can make that 
to no, say they're well, the somebody fullest. else. Yeah. yeah, it's not one of these things. Well, if you look at a segment where it's not indexed <laughs> and you know golf data tech doesn't go, we think you know there's there's none. Yeah, of it's 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 Vokey all the way, and then it's it's sort of the back and forth is between Cleveland and Callaway. Whether you're looking at units where where Cleveland um, typically does a bit better. Um, mm -hmm. versus dollar share where that that's kind of tilted towards Callaway in recent years. And it's so for me looking at this, this release before I start thinking, Hey, what's the technology and what's the performance advantage here? And what have they done differently that might be compelling? The thing that, right. that immediately pops into my mind is, all right, how much do these cost? Because whether they want it to be or not, when, when you look at recognizable names in the wedge market, the brands that, that people still know, Mm -hmm. And Cleveland you said been around a long time, has a name yeah. that people recognize in the wedge category. Sure. How, how much are they? What's what's the cost benefit? And that, you know that like that's what do I get that's that? their market advantage now. And that's not to say they don't perform well or there's not real R and D or anything like that. But you know, if I'm thinking about why I might buy a Cleveland wedge, it's because I feel like I can get similar performance to the other guys for less money. If they come in at the safe, same price point, I'm probably going to go a different way. I think judging by what we see in the marketplace, the average consumer is probably going to go a different way. So, mm -hmm. you know, is this wedge going to come in? Is it going to come in at 160, 170 like everybody else? Or is this going to be a 140, 130 type of proposition? Mm -hmm. I, I agree entirely. And I think what I'm going to be interested to see is, like I said, what kind of storytelling or what type of support Cleveland puts behind it because I do think that's a place where they've done an uneven job in the past. Uh, the, the CBX zip core commercials did not resonate for me. Um, the kind of auto tune corrected stuff like I, it didn't do much for me in terms of taking them seriously as a performance first type of brand in the wedge space. And, and, Admittedly, I'm probably not the target demographic for that particular wedge. So, you know, take that with a grain of salt. But I want to see what they do around this wedge, if they, who they're trying to attract and what type of horsepower they put behind it. Um, or are they going to kind of say, hey, we're kind of comfortable with, with what we have. We think we can get about what we had before by, you know, making a nice product, putting it out there. And, and I guess we'll see. I mean, uh, uh, like I said, I'll be interested to see what they do with that. Yeah. Details to come, as they always do. So T B D D P X G three letters synonyms. Uh, here we go. O three seventeen. Everything's O three seventeen now, right? Super no, no. So no, that's that's part of the story, right? Everything is O three eleven. That's what I meant. Except these are O three seventeen. Okay, so I was right. They are O three seventeen Super Tour. Super Tony, Tour. They the, are the, the tech sole story. 0317 product at this time, as far as I know, as I can remember. And with most product releases like this, the tech story isn't much. It's not supposed to be much. It's a muscle back. So yeah. Blade. And so you get, iron. it's a precision story, whether that's the precision that goes into making the iron or the precision that playing the iron theoretically gives you on the golf course provided you have the ability to precisely operate this particular bit of equipment so because they are yeah you know, i and some of this is recollection and and sure. whether or not my memory is accurate but looking back at the previous generation of super tour iron which i think correct me if i'm wrong i think that was a gen 4 umbrella product um, but was it maybe labeled explicitly as because it didn't come out same time? Yeah, it perhaps? was trickled out. Yeah, I am, I'm I'm struggling to remember exactly, but just you know, unimportant detail there. But just looking back at you know the the top line on those irons, mm -hmm. like it was scary thin. Where this, Very, I yeah. mean, this is this yep. is still a thin top line, yeah, but but not not as thin as it was. Again, you know, based on my recollection, and I, I could be misremembering. Uh, a la Andy Pettit, according to Roger <laughs> Clemens, but um, yeah, I don't, I don't think it's that severe, but it's still looking at these. Does this, this product a, matter? Does this? I mean, like, is this a big deal, little deal? I, I mean, what is 10? your? It's your market share on on something like this. It's a two percent product. Mm -hmm. um, 
So it's, that's it's, not really why you come out with this product, no, though, right? It's a like show it's kind of a, and like like we talked about before. It's kind of a signature piece. It kind of shows what you can do in that that sort of classic timeless space. And I don't I don't know that anybody's going to look at this super tour iron and describe the the design as classic or timeless with with the milling and the replaceable right. weights and things like that. But it, it really is sort of the a modern take on this classic blade, albeit with a couple of cavity backs thrown into the set. But mm -hmm. I mean, this is a, this is a no nonsense iron, no frills, no, no goo on the inside. None of that kind of stuff. It's, I mean, it's, it's pure in design. Uh, even if you, mm -hmm. you don't necessarily find the aesthetics the same way. So let me, let me ask you this question because so often when we talk about PXG, right, we're talking, especially in the iron space, and I'll leave wedges aside for a moment. Their wedges tested incredibly well this year. Um, but particularly in the iron space, since its inception, we talk about the competitive advantages, secret sauce, thin faces, polymer, goo, goo, uh, goo things, right? I mean, this has been kind of their uh, their defining characteristics in, in, in that particular space. So if you take a PXG, if you take that label off of this club... What is it? I mean, what what about this club makes it PXG other than the label that's particularly uh, on it? Yeah, probably. I would, honestly, right the the logo, the milling, and that big chunk of swappable weight in the center. But mm -hmm. otherwise, this this is a club that could be in anybody else's lineup. There's no proprietary technology here. It's just the effort that goes into to making it right and in fairness we see that right in in this space and i think the fitting story part of uh we're seeing this more and i i'll be very interested to me when i saw this iron it made me think yes all those things but also you know we talked in the last generation with phd clubs about fitting for head weight and and it's one of the things that i don't know i i wish phd would have gone more in depth on this or maybe been a little bit louder about it but you know it's one of the things that in the retail area tends to be so standardized across the board. I mean, we've seen, you know, Mizuno has multiple headweights, right? Different length builds. We've seen inside titles where they have a whole alphabet's worth of different headweights in terms of uh, making sure we get things built correctly. But more often than not, amateur golfers tend to play headweights that are, that are more or less uniform. Whereas when you go out on tour, that's not at all the case. And so, movable headweights adele we're seeing that with right with their stuff we're seeing playing with placement of weight in a in an iron head where arguably there's there's more mass uh you know obviously than than other clubs um you know I'd be interested to see if if pxg would sink their teeth more into that part of the fitting story um, you know, if there is a lot of evidence and data to support like, hey, we are really seeing a lot of performance changes based on how heavy or light a head is. And it's not necessarily, hey, the faster you swing it, the heavier head you need or anything like that. Like, w w you know, is there anything to that? Like, I, I, I mean, I don't know. It's, there has to be something to it because we know in, in every other aspect of golf fitting, one mm -hmm. size does not fit all. So this this whole idea of like we're gonna we're gonna go through all this trouble of standardize or or fitting you for for a shaft and and we're gonna in some cases get the the grip dialed in because we know that that can make a difference. But when we're all through with that, everybody gets the same head weight. It fundamentally just doesn't make sense. No. And so it you know to have that ability to to swap that weight and give the user a different experience an alternative during fitting, I think, I think makes a lot of sense. And if I recall talking to, to Brad and Nico over at PXG, it's, I think it's more than half or don't end up in the standard weight. It's a healthy percentage. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And again, it's, you know, the, I don't expect you're going to see very clear as day, like, whoa, blown away by, you know, if you go heavier, it's, it's 10 more yards. I think, I think it's subtle. I think it's probably going to be reflected more in consistency numbers than distance or things like that. But, mm -hmm. you know, absolutely it, it does make sense. But if there are all other dials and knobs that you can turn in a fitting and theoretically, right, the more variables that you can control or assess, 
in a fitting theoretically, right? The better fit that you can get. And we always talk, you know, we talk a lot about marginal improvements and th- Hey, you know, if, it, if you have to answer the following question with, no, I've never done that, then there might be something there. And that question is, Hey, have you ever been fit based on your preferred blank? Like you said, length, loft, da, 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 head weight. Have you ever been fit for your preferred head weight in an iron or a wedge or what, you know, no. No, because Never I mean, for, for the most part, most most brands don't give you that don't. option in an iron. <laughs> it just doesn't exist. I mean, right. TaylorMade has done it. Callaway has, I believe, one of the Apex models has still has that that factory swappable. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know how many fitting locations have the capacity to take advantage of it. Or is that just to hit like a swing weight target? Like, well, hey, we need to build these at D two, and so and that, we need that's to change often the weight, how you know? it's built, right? If you can, if you can swap the weight to hit a swing weight target, effectively you can also swap that weight to make it heavier or lighter, just because right. you're finding that heavier or lighter works for a given golfer. So it's right. capability. It's it's you know who has that capability, and that that's a limited yeah. set. Just just from right a design perspective, right? Who who offers irons where you can change a weight? And then the next piece of it is who offers that capability in every single fitting environment that, that they right. service? And that's that's an entirely different question. So I think that's you know one of the standout advantages for, for PXG in the fitting space. Does it necessarily make them better for everybody? Hell no. But it's right. it's it's an option they bring to the table that you don't see mm-hmm. from everybody else. So it's I mean it's intriguing. Yeah, I'm, you know, well, it's I'm intrigued. Not a world I beater see. for sure, but it's it's something. It's a little yeah. bit extra. A little extra, Tony. If you lived in Australia right now, what could you get today or now that us poor people in North America are going to have to wait a while for? And why? Kangaroo meat? Is that a thing? Yes. Yes. <laughs> what are marsupials? Uh, uh, I'll take marsupials for 200, um, uh, Alex. Very nasty <laughs> snake bite. I mean, we've got venomous animals. What are they able to. Uh, we'll get no, Greg you're going to get Chalmers in here to talk about steaks and spiders <laughs> and, and kangaroos. You can get the new ping stuff. You can get ping. Is ping that available like today? I don't Australia? know, but. It's coming soon. But what's it's the deal with this? Soon. So, yeah. so first of all, Sons tell me, what is the deal with that? What's going on? Sons of bitches. What is going on? Yeah. So, I mean, we saw cropped up on the USGA release, which today is we're recording. Two days ago is we're publishing. G430, Max, LST, and SFT. 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 Lust, Sift, Max. Um, yep. Yeah. And as we, you know, we're going we're gonna to get a preliminary, I guess, Overview of the tech here before too long, and then you know we'll gear up for a full release. I'm guessing January ish, but mm-hmm. yeah, they're going to do what they did last time around uh, with the 425s repeat, and they are going to release this product in Australia and I would assume New Zealand just because it's kind of right there. Sure. <laughs> um, yeah. Why not uh, just throw New Zealand? Yeah, in just pretty like pretty right away, and then the rest of us over here and. In the U.S. Why? And, and Europe, why, why release it spite. there? It's got to be. I mean, spite, this happened, right? This happened with P. Uh, sorry, this happened with Ping before, right? Yeah, spite it was a spite. Spite. Yeah. They don't like you. They don't like They're me. Like, they don't yeah, like you North know America. We don't. We don't need this North American market. We're going to move the needle down with the. You know, we're going to sell a bunch of these to kangaroos and koalas, and right. You no, know, I, I mean it's. There is a is it a supply thing. chain thing? Is it there, like what, there is what a is logic? It? I think I don't know that you'd ever hear anybody at Ping admit to it, acknowledge it publicly, but I think they probably got hit with the supply chain issue worse than than many of their competitors. You had you know they I don't know how well it's known, but you know Ping has shifted a good bit of its manufacturing to Vietnam. Mm-hmm. Kind of got just obliterated in the second wave of COVID. So they dealing with that. Um, it was rumored, and I'm sure somebody could probably pull it out of import logs that that Ping was one of the brands that not only had some stuff backed up uh, in a canal at one point, but also had some stuff fall over the edge. Of, a lot of floating. Yeah. So I mean, there's some Ping stuff you can probably find at the bottom of the Pacific if you want to go looking for it. So. Mm-hmm. 
they got hit pretty hard with that. And I don't know to what extent they're completely caught up, but it's one of those things where, Hey, if we're, if we're not operating at full capacity right now, if we cannot get all this product in to service the immediate demand, then, then why? And this is a similar approach that Mizuno was talking, taking when we talked to Chris last yeah. week, kind of the same thing. Yeah. If, if you can't provide all the inventory you need on day one, if you're going to have customers waiting six, eight, 12 weeks, Right. For an order, why why put it into the marketplace when you know, hey, we can we have enough mm -hmm. to to service this this market, which mm -hmm. is just going into its peak golf season. So why do we why why should we rush it into the U.S. market when you know it's not going to be it's not going to be nice for you yeah. much longer. It's not going to be nice no. for me much longer. And yeah, I know right. guys in Southern California and Florida and the Sun Belt in general. We'll rub it in and, and tell us they play year round, but that's not everybody for sure. And so right. I, I guess it makes sense to wait. Well, do you think this will flip eventually? I mean, uh, the the issues around supply chain and, you know, inventory and all of those kind of things. Let's assume that those do get ironed out and, and we're back to whatever full capacity, you know, schedules kind of look like that there aren't these external factors playing in there. Do you think we should expect for the next next launch, let's say every, every, if everything's kind of running smoothly by then, do you think we'll see North America first and, and the world second or just kind of launching them all simultaneously? I think, I think or do you everybody think... at the same time is probably <laughs> ideal. I mean, I a don't know. worldwide launch. Yeah, just I would worldwide. Think, yeah, I think I think that's probably the best way to do it. Uh, if, if for no other reason, then you don't have to, it, it allows you to coordinate the messaging a whole lot better. So it's not yeah. like, Hey, you know what, we're going to, we're going to give Australian media the deep dive and, right. and let them publish the information they have now. And then U S guys will talk to them later <laughs> and they're, they're under strict embargo until early January. And that's, I don't think that's right. a situation anybody thinks is awesome or wants no. to have. So I think, as soon as possible, not just ping. I think everybody's going right. to try and normalize. But what about the actual equipment? Yet. So let's talk about the actual clubs based on, I mean, again, stock photos that we get from the conforming list don't tell much of a story ever, and they're not <laughs> They are not to, detailed high-resolution imagery. That's man. not what they're yeah. for. But based on what we know about ping in the past, based on you know your understanding, what – what might we expect with this or what, what's kind of your best prognostication and or uh, guess with G430? So I kind of I thought about this a little bit and, and simplifying. And I think it's this is largely true for everybody. But I think Ping, especially when you kind of look at their approach to to manage, design R&D and, and what they hope to accomplish, it's Hey, can we make it faster? Can we make it more forgiving? And can we make it more versatile from a fitting perspective? Mm -hmm. So those are the three things. And again, I, I think you'll probably see elements of all of those. And Ping's not going to come out and tell you, hey, we, we made it you know, 10 yards worth of faster. Right. The, as I mentioned in the article, the forgiveness piece is, is tricky because the Max in particular, the reason it was called the Max is it, is legitimately pushing up against that maximum heel toe MOI limit. So is there, right. is there, they, you know, maybe top to bottom stability is a little bit better. That would be one potential area of improvement and that gets you greater spin consistency, which is something Marty Jertz and over at Ping has talked spin about. Quite consistency. A bit. Right. So that's an option. Speed. There's always a speed story. I don't know where it's going to come from, but again, always a speed story and and with ping it's it's not going to be that five more yards it's going to be it's, yeah it's, it's a little bit faster because yeah. that's and whether that's through aerodynamics i don't expect the turbulators will have disappeared uh, as much as some people still complain about them so that's that's one option and then you know is it is it more versatile from a fitting perspective can we fit more golfers within each design not only into the discrete designs but then within each design, SFT, LST, and, and Max, can we can we yep. dial in the target golfer even better? And that's where I look at a, maybe maybe that weight on the back is heavier. Mm -hmm. Maybe there's a little bit more movement in the weight track. So that's, you know, those are the kind of things I'm looking at just across the board with all three. And then 
you know, jumping ahead to the SFT, very, very obvious they've done that because now you've gone from that fixed weight. You now have right. a two, what appears to be a two position draw and draw plus. Draw Extra and draw. more draw. Yep. Super draw. Super draw. Mega so, draw. So if you're, yeah, if you're a slicer, you, for my money, that was already far and away the best driver in the market for, for dealing with that problem, especially if it's we're talking a severe slice. Mm -hmm. Nothing was close. We see it in our testing no. every year, nothing even remotely close to what, what the SFT provides in terms of shot shape correction. Yep. And now to, and again, we don't know what these positions are, are going to No, but reasonable to think that, that the three models are going to maintain kind of their, uh, their labels kind of indicate what we're looking at, right? SFT being the one that will correct the slice the most, right? The one that will be most draw bias, the max theoretically fitting the majority of the population, kind of that 80%. You know, the maximum again, percentage of the market. Mm -hmm. one and model. then, and then people that really need to cut spin at all costs and say, Hey, that's well, something they have to do. That's, you know, likely where LST comes in. Well, and that's, that's the interesting piece for me though, because I would not describe LST as a, as a cut spin at all costs driver. It's not, mm -hmm. it's not in that stealth plus category. It's, it's not even in like a TSR three category. I mentioned LTD XLS is another one where these guys really mm -hmm. are chasing low spin and, and Titleist, you know, chasing lower spin still with TSR four and the, the three, you know, is sort of, I would guess maybe in between like a stealth plus and, and where I think the LST will land in terms mm -hmm. of low spin, but pings not, I'd be, I'd be really interested to see them do it. I would love to see what does it look like if ping says, you know what, we're going to, we're going to, we're going to give up forgiveness on this one. We're going to, we're just going to uh -huh. let this MOI thing go. And we are going to go all in on a low spin design. I mean, I would love to see that from ping. I what would, would you call it? Um, they're like, Hey, Tony, we're going to come out with a, an LST, like an ultra LST, but you get to name it. Because, I think you have to call because, it like the XLST, right? That's, that's just what, what the golf industry calls for. It has to be like extreme low spin or, or yeah. something like that. But again, I think it'd be cool to see. It'd be really interesting to see what Ping's capabilities are in that space. Mm -hmm. I just don't see them doing it. And again, as I mentioned in the article, I, arguably there's no reason for them to do it because the no. competitors, if you look over the past couple, two, three generations of clubs, competitors have run after them. That is the one. Like if you talk about the, uh, sure. you know, the Callaway, right? The, mm -hmm. you know, the one I'm talking about name escapes me because I'm, I'm having my brain. We have functioning. rogues, we got Mavericks. But they're they're kind of max LST or max right. L, max LS. There we go, right? Right. The, the low their low spin that doesn't have a lot of diamonds in the name, right? They're they're no <laughs> diamond low spin driver. The first one came out with with the you know a couple of years back. That was mm -hmm. you know it was meant to compete with the LST, the the Cobra, sure. you know the Cobra Max. Uh, they're sort of the one in the middle again, struggling with names. Right. Long layoff for me. <laughs> um, but again, that, that sort of, we want to be in that space where it's, it's truly forgiving, but still mm -hmm. has a low spin characteristic. And that's, I mean, that's a sweet spot in the market. And so when, when other competitors have kind of run at ping to get to that, to the, get to that spot, I don't know why they would run away and go, no, no, no. Now we're going to be. We're going we're gonna to do a get concept out of this. car. Yeah, we're not going to get it. We're going to leave this yeah. moderate to low spin area uh, where we've had a very successful driver. The one that, that manufacturers tell me is very difficult for them to beat in hitting bays. And we're going right. to run away from that to chase right. something that doesn't align with our, our, our brand philosophy. I, right. said, I would love to see it, but I just, I, well, I don't see it. Happening. And the other, the other fallacy that we should mention, right, is this idea that low spin is better. Like this idea, hey, we can get a lower spin. Lower. It is for some people, but it's, you know, it's about matching that spin and launch and total trajectory and just uniformly saying, hey, you know, low spin is something to, yeah, th there's a certain segment of the population that that helps, but it's not like ball speed where in general, hey, more ball speed is going to be advantageous for 
you know, damn near. Yeah, every with, with a driver, spin, there are, not that way. Yeah, there's there's not a lot of guys who don't benefit for, from higher speed with a driver. Right, but, right. And and again, you know, to your point, I think there's a case to be made that as an industry as a whole, sort of reached a tipping point and maybe gone to an extreme chasing low spin because you can. Mm-hmm. I understand it if you're if you're trying to win that battle in a demo bay, and right. you know a guy is only going to look at one or two shots. And he's, right. he's not even going to look at the directionality of those two shots. He's just going to nope. want to know. Just total how far carry, they went. total yeah, distance. Look at that. Yeah. that one, I carried that one 280 yards. And, you know, so what if it landed 65 yards offline? It was on a rope. You know, I, I to get yeah, that so- ball speed and that kind of distance, that's that's what a lot of the, the guys that, that aren't getting going through a full fitting are looking for. And so, like, low They're spin. They're playing home run derby. Yeah. Low if spin you're playing home run derby. Battle. Right. And, yeah. The 1700. You know, 17 degrees of launch, 1,700 knuckleball uh, will win home run derby every time. Oh. But, you know. You get f- Honestly, yeah. in some of these simulators, right, a four, 14 and 1,400. I mean, if you yeah. can get that number, you're going to hit bombs. But, it's, but right. it's not sustainable. It's not, it's not, it's not playable. playable. And so, you know. And, and, you know, back to it, I don't know why Ping would run away from where they yeah. are just because I think it would be cool to see what they could do in that space. I'm uh, going to be very interested to see if Ping changes up any of its materials. Yeah, um, I was just getting to that. So this is, you, you know, look, we kind didn't of the, see it with, um, we didn't it see here. it with Titleist, right? They largely stuck with, uh, you know, a lot of titanium and new generations of titanium, um, you know, obviously Callaway and TaylorMade have explored carbon uh, all over the club, right? Including faces. Uh, now, Ping has always been more conservative, right? In in that regard, from a material standpoint, um, does is this an opportunity? Is this a place where they sure looks like it? It looks like it, doesn't it? So again, in the in the USGA, and again, markings, I'm speculating. Well, I mean, we know something. Kind of. So the USGA provides a list of markings on the club, which are basically an, a rundown of every little thing that manufacturers write on on the club anywhere on the club, tungsten. and as you know, right, tungsten, forge, <laughs> etc. And so, with the driver, with the G30 LST, there is a carbon fly wrap, and mm-hmm. so the. For me, the logical step was, well, carbon fly is probably a little bit of a play on dragonfly, you know, sort of pings. I don't want to say mesh, but it is kind of that open cell frame uh, that supports the crown. An exoskeleton, an internal exoskeleton. I don't know. That's that's the right phrase right there. It was born from a dragonfly's wing. That's right. That that structure, that's where it comes from. And so the carbon fly, uh, as far as maybe I know, maybe they that found is, a dragon fly that was made say, out of carbon. I, as far as <laughs> I know, a, the... <laughs> a carbon fly is not a thing that exists in nature. So we don't I'm, know that. We, I, I mean, those ping testing grounds and their R and D stuff's pretty wild. Maybe. And yeah, I mean, you've been to Arizona. You don't really know what you're going to find down no, there. No, but there um, could be some carbon flies. Yep. I suspect this is going to be some sort of use of carbon fly or carbon fiber. In a mm-hmm. wraparound crown, maybe that's you know that's that's what I'm getting yep. out of it. So we'll see, and it'd be interesting to see. Hey, why why does this appear to be exclusive to the LST? Mm-hmm. What and made so you change? Not... Obviously, we know two things that are universally true about carbon in in construction: it's lighter and stronger, right? So typically, you would use it when you want to save weight in one area and reallocate or redistribute, uh, redistribute that weight in other areas that are maybe more advantageous for whatever design you're trying to work around. And so I would anticipate that's part of the story. And then, like you said, if that's the case, let's assume that it is, if it's advantageous in that design, what kept it from being advantageous in the other designs? Again, we're totally speculating. We're guessing. I mean, logically, I mean, it's, it's, to me, it's, what makes sense is, hey, we, we wanted to hit a certain center of gravity position, and this is the material that allowed us to get there. Mm-hmm. We'll see. but it's, We'll find it's, out soon again, enough. Intriguing. Yeah, by January. 
<laughs> we'll, play. We'll, have maybe or we'll, we'll just see, see what the Australian a, people have to say, yeah. We'll expense a fact-finding mission to Australia to get to the bottom of this. But. Let's do it, Tony. Let's go. You yeah. and I on the plane. It's, Put another shrimp on the bobby. I said snakes, man. It's snakes. snakes. But all these clubs rely on something, and that is a golf ball, Tony. They rely on a golf ball to be hit and... It is tour seating time for the next generation of Pro V One. I love I love that we still like we're this this late in the game, so we're like what what I say about three months from these things hitting retail and yep. it's still and it's this not exclusively a titleist thing. Everybody no. plays this silly nonsense game, no. but it's like right. hey, these tour prototypes. I'm like, these are not these are not prototypes. This is we're they well are past prototypes were a year ago, right? And they're like, here you go, guys. You'll eat it and you'll like it. That's mm-hmm. that's where we are with the new Titleist Pro V1 and Pro V1 okay. X Golf Ball. 2023 2023. If I have my so, calendar correct. Let's let's do some prognosticating here. Again, we know Pro V1, Pro V1 X. Again, Titleist franchise, number one in, in pretty much every measurable category across the ball space. Number one in general uh, in, in our testing from a performance consistency uh, stand or manufacturing consistency uh, consistency standpoint, it is the benchmark against which all other golf balls are judged. It is it's the one to be franchise. It's yeah, that when you talk simple. to every other manufacturer, it's they the know benchmark. That that's, yeah, that's who they're going against. No secrets or new information there. So there's always a risk, right? When you're in that position, why change it at all? And secondarily. What are we hoping to see, Tony? Or what are we expecting to see? What would you like to see? I would like to see them come in red. (laughs) Okay, what's realistic for Um, us to see? What what are we thinking here, Tony? What I mean, Um, what are we thinking? Pro V1X, right? It's the highest compression. Let's start there. Pro V1X is, it's the, of the models, it's the highest launching and, and highest spinning, right? So, uh, of this franchise, I'm not saying let's let's, let's you know what let's let's break a bad habit right now. Let's, let's do get, that. Let's get our listeners into the habit trajectory. Of You're hearing, go. yep, hearing yep. about it. golf ball performance the correct way, and and hopefully learning to speak that language. Yes, not no not more launch. launch. They every golf ball we tested, you know, going back to the last test, I think was at high speeds even was less than a less than a degree of launch. They all launch like this. They all yeah, launch pretty all much damn near the same. They it's, all go up. It's it's yeah. So let's talk about the the flight characteristics. The trajectory. but it's it's this. Where does it reach that peak height? How long does it stay there? How does it descend? Right. What does that total trajectory look like? So Pro V One X in terms of trajectory highest and flying, spin, highest, highest flying, highest, highest compression also. If you right, if we're not if we're theirs. leaving if we're leaving left dash out of the equation, yes. Of yeah, of of the Pro V one, Pro V one X. So the, the two balls we can leave left dot and left dash out for right now because these are the eighty to ninety percent, right? This is the uh the retail stuff. So of the two, Pro V one, Pro V one X, higher total trajectory, higher launch, not launch, higher trajectory, higher spin, higher ball speed. That's fair. I like that. Why change it? What What do you expect? It's it's always going to be subtle, subtle tweaks because they. You know, I mentioned this. I think the phrase I used in the in the in the story is that tour pros tend to they like the idea of a better ball. Give me something better, but I definitely don't want a different ball. I want I want exactly <laughs> this ball. I don't want uh-huh. it to change, but somehow somehow. Well, giving me this ball that's exactly the same, find a way to make it just a little bit better or as as good as you can make it anyway. Mm-hmm. So I think it's whatever it is, it's it's going to be subtle. And I think we always look greenside spin and, and you don't know whether, hey, this is just, again, the info that Title sent over this morning, looking through some of the quotes and you don't know if it's, hey, this is just what Scotty Scheffler said. Right. Or this is the stuff that Scotty Scheffler said that we want to put out there as, as kind of a teaser of what's to come. Right. And so 
you know, reading between lines that may not actually exist, borderline tinfoil hat on my part. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, he mentioned Greenside being extremely important, which I think that's that's a universal truth. Right. Um, but you know, highlighted again, so there could be something in there uh, around Greenside improvements, enhancements. And then the other piece that, that Scotty Scheffler touched on that, that he really that's important to him and he likes to, to look at is the performance in the wind. And there, mm -hmm. there's always opportunities there. I don't think anybody has, has maxed out their capabilities uh, in terms of how you, you mitigate wind. So, and these are, you know, the, the tricky thing there is I don't, you know, short game performance. I think some people pay close attention to. We also know that some people think, you know, a, something like a, Specific example, right? It was a Strixon soft feel spinning more than a Pro V1X around the green. Right. Some people believe that Idiot. is that is true. It's right. It's just not categorically false. Point right? being, like that's that's something that some golfers may or may not notice once you once you make that leap to wind performance. And again, we don't even know if this is going to be part of the story. But once you right, we're, once we're you make that leap, here. yeah, yeah. Once right. you make that leap to wind performance, now you're really in this this spot where you mm -hmm. know. Who, who actually notices that? Who's looking for it? Unless yeah. unless there are cases where, you know, I've, I've experimented with balls in the past that I would describe as catastrophically bad in the wind. Uh, so if it's if it's absolutely disgraceful wind performance, you may notice. But otherwise, yeah, you know, it's it's sort of one of those benefits that you you might appreciate even if you you don't even realize that you've been given it. Yeah, I agree. I think it'll be tweaks. I think, you know, I'm always interested with with the titles franchise to see whether the the two primary balls, again, we're talking Pro V1X and Pro V1, whether those are more overlapping, you know, like a Venn diagram, <laughs> you know, like, are we going to get more area of overlap or are they going to try to separate them more, right, in terms of having really, really discrete models? And there's still, I, I still think there's a good, a uh, number of consumers that are confused from, you know, X number of generations ago where it's still, basically wait. title was flip-flopped and they didn't tell anybody. And it was every, like, wait a minute. I every thought Every time this comes up, Harry, <laughs> Harry loses his mind about it. Yeah. He's like, yeah, it's it's like, like, what the hell are they going to flip it back? Are they going to, are we going to do this? Are we going to do that? Are we going to, which ones, which I thought Pro V1X was this one. And, and now it's that one. It's like, Oh my God. You know? So I, I, that's, you know, in terms of the launch and spin, those things, I guess, what I'm interested to see is compared to the existing generation, you said the current generation. Again. Ah, whatever trajectory. It's going to take me a while. I need a swear jar. Put in a dollar. I'll give away a head cover every time I say launch. Um, are they going to be closer together or or further apart in terms of launch and spin profiles, um, trajectory and spin? situations so this is I, this is where kind of that that and we can get in more detail here but this is where to me the left dot piece of the equation really comes in because how so so left dot right is described as a lower flying lower spinning pro v1 and mm -hmm. there's there's some nuance in that because left dot predates and you probably know the the, the vintage of the, yeah so yeah. you know the vintage of the left dot better than I do so it's essentially you know and, and when did Titleist make that switch that we talk about and so yeah. the idea yeah. that so left dot is described as a lower flying lower flatter trajectory I would describe it lower spinning Pro V1 which is intriguing except if you sort of look at the evolution of the Pro V1 through the years and the thing I, I, I haven't talked about it much, but I would say that if we look at our, our data from the our last ball test, which would have been 2021, is that right? Yeah. Whatever you stayed in that those people's house when they were still no, that was, or that was it was two years removed. Different from, story from That's Wendy and Ray, story. but yeah, um, I was I was surprised. I don't want to say taken aback, but I was I was surprised by by the performance of the Pro V1, the current generation. Uh, it was lower flying and lower spinning than I, I would have expected maybe mm -hmm. from that particular ball. And I mentioned before mm -hmm. that the industry has has chased and, and to a degree consumers, golfers, even professional golfers have almost demanded like these lower spin products. And I think the Pro V1 
in my opinion anyway, it has probably evolved with that. Mm -hmm. And as soon as you put a left dot, and now, and I would say, we, we had Vosh on last time to talk about right. JPX and the new HL. And HL, I think there is, yeah. you're starting to see kind of the industry swing back the other way a little bit. And I don't want to say running away from, from lower spin, but, but certainly taking a more of a stance that, Hey, maybe it's, it's not ideal for everyone. And maybe we should all, look yeah. to, to put a little more spin back in the game. And so if, if Titleist does something with left op, whether that's re-engineer it to, to a newer left out, which was cool because we just like new stuff, or it's just going to say, you know what, let's, let's make this, this pro V one, this, this kind of lower flying, lower spinning pro V one available for everybody who wants it. That's an opportunity to put a little bit more spin and a little bit of a higher flight back into a pro V one, which, admittedly shifts it bumps it a little bit towards a pro v1x and i'm not i have no idea this may not you know they, they very well may not do this but to me that that makes sense for the the average golfer out there buying a pro v1 i think mm -hmm. you know certainly we've got enough data that says you know what you and you and you and you and yeah you're you're one guy who's maybe a little different but that guy over there and those two other guys too they they would all Most benefit. Most need launch and spin. Most from, are, yeah, raising the ball up higher that flight, with more spin. A little more spin. So I, I would actually like to see them come a little bit closer together. I don't want to see overlap. I mean, right. we've seen we've seen brands overlap. I think let's be honest, right? TP5, TP5X is a good example where they have the same in, dimple pattern, right? In, well, just not just that, but in in right. trying to sort of make TP5 a little more what what TP5X or what those guys wanted it to be and, and X, you know, yeah. sort of like, hey, well, we'd like this to do this thing that X does and we like X to do this thing. That yeah, there wasn't enough does. separation between. Yeah, the you two. bring them too close together. And so I, I hope Titleist doesn't do that, obviously, but it, it, I think there's an opportunity to to move Pro V1 back to the, to the true middle, a sensible middle. Mm -hmm. So, you know. So maybe. for your money, it's gotten a little bit... Maybe it's on lower. the low end of the of the again all relative. So sure, is it low spin compared to a Chrome Soft? No, but that those balls as much as as much as Callaway might tell you differently, those aren't those aren't true competitors. Like right. the Pro V One is a ball that is played on tour. The Chrome Soft is a soft ball that that has a urethane cover that's. You know, feels good for people who like a soft feeling ball and still want right. a year of thing. But it isn't for the played spin on, I mean, But yeah, yeah, it's not. It's right. the compression is is just not there. It's right for for tour. So yeah, I think that's that's an opportunity. I don't know if they're going to do it. Um, but I want to see a chart. I want us to come up with a chart where we take basically the existing four. Right. So now we now we are going to expand it to left dot and left dash, and take left dash, Pro V One X. Pro V1 and then Pro V1 left dot, right? And we know what those balls are right now today, right? And then we know we're getting at least two new ones, right? Pro V1, Pro V1 X, and see where those fit, right? And then maybe that might help inform what space remains, you know? If, because I could see, I could see a situation where Pro V1 X actually becomes a little more like left dash right where maybe it keeps some of the trajectory profile right because left dash higher trajectory very low spin right if relative, uh, on, again relative on, for a tour for, level ball it's for a, yeah it's not as low spin ball. again it's chrome soft tour response something like that <laughs> okay so if it did right so if Pro V1X moves slightly towards left dash, that would leave this huge gap in the middle where, like you're saying, Pro V1 could kind of assume more of a true, authentically middle of the road. You know, again, context shift all the time. So, again, we're, we're kind of prognosticating, guessing if people do need more spin, which we think that they do. If we do need a little higher trajectory, which, again, we think that they do. If that's the case, and, and Titleist is 
seeing some of those same things maybe come out. Maybe Pro V1 shifts a little bit more that way as well, leaving this low, low area for a revamped left dot of sorts. And you also have AVX in, in that space too. And so that, that's another thing. Yes. Is yeah. We're, we're, we get so focused on the relationship between the, the stock Pro V1 and the stock Pro V1X. You almost mm -hmm. forget like there's, a, there's this other thing in the Titleist lineup called well, AVX. Damn it. If they name it something other than AVX, like Pro V1 AVX or something. Pro V1S. Like, I've, I've maintained I, forever. It should be the Pro V1S for soft, but um, that's if, just me. If, but, if all of your children had the same last name, it would be easier to keep track of them all. I forget the ones <laughs> that have different names so yeah. so and and that's the balance too is as as that pro v1 has kind of crept down in spin and that spin yeah. profile is are we has it gotten a little too close to avx to the point where you know and then i don't want to say this is the only point of differentiation because there is you know the right. dimple patterns and and the the flight they they produce are are significantly different but right i mean you creeping towards the point where where pro v1 might just be you know thought of as a firm avx or avx is just a soft yeah. pro v1 and i don't you know there's the performance differences need to extend beyond you know feel to to the point that that's you know it's significant enough that people notice above and beyond the feel and i think yeah left out is a great example of that where not everybody yeah, I understand not everybody's going to see those differences, but especially for me as a as a left dash guy who had played by the time left dot right. came out, almost two years of left dash, and then to right. put left dot in it and just experiment with that ball and go, yeah, I see that immediately. Like that mm -hmm. just, I mean, instead of this, it's yeah, yeah. it's yeah, wildly different. And it turned out flatter. working, yeah, yeah, working with the fitters that turned out to not be what I needed. I ended up sticking in left dash, but. But I mean, you that, that's see. the kind of separation ideally you have between mm -hmm. any, and it doesn't matter if it's Titleist, if it's Callaway, if it's Bridgestone, yeah. that's what you want to see in a lineup is where you can, you know, even if, you know, you're, you're seeing, watching on a robot, it's a great example of like, Hey, yeah, we're not going to change the robot. We're just going to change the ball. Right. And we want to be able, we want it so that everybody can see the flight difference. And that's well, and yeah, and I would love to see again. I'm a fan of simplifying things for consumers to help them make better decisions. I would love to see if this were me saying, I would love to see titles, whether they have three balls or four balls, same franchise, same name. Maybe that means that AVX and, and Left Dot become one product or something. But let's That's say so you tricky. have four products and it's the trajectory and spin, and you have them organized, you know, again, by that trajectory and spin combination and you have one two three four right and it's, i'm not saying you name them one two three four but you name them whatever you name them <laughs> the pro v1 one, one. <laughs> pro v1 or maybe one, it's a pro, pro v2 that. the pro v3 and the pro v4 what are we <laughs> right doing? or or whatever it is but like man you know i think to take another step right and and this is something titleist there's the benefit of tradition and the benefit of doing things a certain way because Obviously, you don't become, get to where they've gotten by changing things every year. But from a consumer standpoint, if I'm trying to make a better decision on which ball is going to fit me better and I'm buying one, make it simple for me. Give me a chart. One, two, three, four. Here are the four different ones. Here's what I want. I hear you. And, and I think it's a good idea, but I think, I think that type of thinking causes companies to – to almost put themselves in a box unnecessarily. And again, I will, I think the title list is an ideal or a, a great example of the situation where if you look at, at one point they decided, Hey, Pro V1 X is going to be high, high. And then right. Pro V1 is, is going to be mid, mid, mid. These are the descriptions, right? Necessarily doesn't, right. may not translate to your experience, but these are how they're described. And so AVX was like, when they're designing that ball and they, they wanted something in that lower compression space, it's like, well, where do we put it? Oh, it's, it has to be low, low. Mm -hmm. And so you, you kind of get in, you pigeon yourself into like these linear relationships or maybe even forcing yourself to maintain linear relationships that aren't necessarily ideal. And so when, right. when left dash came in it's like, well, it's, it's, High low. It's high low. <laughs> it threw off the line and I'm like, it should be okay that the line, like don't, don't not put something in the lineup because it, you know, you're, you're taking that line in lineup way too literally. Like it, it can move around right. and right. Yeah. 
Well, and I'm not even saying that has to be linear. I'm just saying plot it. Yeah. Give me a thing yeah. that says low and, you know, we, we have trajectory of, you know, whatever it is, and then just plot them. Because right now it would go low, low, mid, mid, high, high, and then high, low. <laughs> yeah. And, and then sort of, you know, left dot, which is somewhere in between AVX and and the current yeah. Pro V1 or mm-hmm. maybe the Pro V1 that's where closer it gets than AVX. Muddy. It should be. Right. Yeah. It's, um, Right, it's and it's it's golf balls anyway. It's really complicated to to one. I can't describe. wait to get my hands on them. I cannot yeah. wait to test them and see and and see if I see know. what you can see. That's see what that's I can fun, see. Right? I just yeah. I what's, mean, just, what's new? What's different? Just put a. I'll just be happy. I mean, I would love. Like I said, I've talked about a hundred times. Give me a new left dash because I I just want a new left dash to have a new left dash. But mm-hmm. if you're not going to give little me an softer. entirely, yeah, just put a softer cover on it. Don't even yeah. Don't even. Oh, maintain compression. Make the inside. I have a feeling if they made the inside any firmer, it would fail. Explore. USGA, uh, the velocity <laughs> test. Yeah, it, well, it would, it would just <laughs> fail miserably. The, the USGA would be like, no, no, too fast, no, too fast. Do that. No, thank so, you. And that that's got to be part of the balancing act too. But, yeah, yeah. And well, all of this, all of this could be for naught anyway, because if the USGA decides <laughs> to, to roll it yeah. back, we're all going to be playing. Uh, True feel. Yeah. So, right. We'll see. Uh, we'll see. Well, as always, find us on the interwebs. Let us know what do you think about this new equipment? Does it move the needle for you? Do you care? Do you not care? What, what do you want you from the forward? next Pro V1? All what do you want? Questions. What are you excited about? Tell us. Comment. So we can subscribe. I think we're comment, supposed to comment. Like subscribe. and subscribe. Yes. I guess. But until next week, Tony. You are Chris Nickel. I am Tony Covey. And we out. 